Well, history is full of unique military strategies. You're undoubtedly familiar with some of those, things like the hiding of soldiers inside the Trojan horse. Uh, I was reading a little bit this week about the Israeli war for independence, and they didn't have uh, bombs, so they were dropping seltzer bottles from airplanes, which sounded kind of like a bomb falling and did explode somewhat when it hit. read a story of, of uh, uh, the U.S. S. O'Bannon during World War II throwing potatoes at another sub. There was an article July 14, 1984 in the Pittsburgh Press where some of the, uh, the soldiers who had been a part of that were gathering for a reunion, and the article recounted how the sub ended up about 50 feet away from, another Japanese, or from a Japanese sub, and they were too close to use their deck guns. And so a few quick-thinking sailors hauled potatoes out of their storage bins and threw them at the Japanese vessel. One of the soldiers said this. He said, the reason we threw the potatoes was to keep them from shooting. They thought they were hand grenades. That kept them away from their deck guns. The article goes on to say, the potatoes confused the Japanese long enough for the O'Bannon to circle around the sub and get far enough away to, to attack. The submarine sank. The man said, we sank the submarine with potatoes. It was a big joke, but it happened. And the crew received a congratulatory plaque from the Potato Growers Association of Maine <laughs> for its heroic use of potatoes. But that soldier said the plaque had since disappeared. You know, most unique military strategies reflect something of desperation. You know, you don't drop seltzer bottles from airplanes if you have actual bombs to drop, and, and you don't throw potatoes if you actually have grenades. Well, today, as we continue our study of Gideon, we're going to see one of the most unique military strategies of all time. But it's not a sign of desperation. It comes instead from the clear direction of God. It wasn't that the people of Israel needed a Hail Mary to, to maybe have a shot at winning the game at the last minute. It was because God wanted them to clearly understand His power and to see His grace towards them and to recognize the fact that He alone deserves the glory. As we were reminded of last week, the time of, of the judges where this account occurs comes shortly on the heels of of the time of Joshua when they conquered the land of promise. The time of Joshua was characterized by obedience and conquest. The time of Judges, by contrast, is characterized by disobedience and defeat. It records seven cycles of that disobedience, which was followed by God bringing discipline at the hands of one of the oppressors who lived in the land still. And then the people would, would cry out to God, and He would raise up a deliverer. But Judges, and this account, is not simply about man's sin and failure or about human deliverers. It's against the backdrop of that human sin and failure that this book and the account of Gideon shine the spotlight on God and particularly on God's amazing grace. We saw last week that this account begins, as grace always does, with an undeserving people. Chapter 6 began, then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. The people did it evil. They forsook the Lord, and they worshiped the gods of the people in the land rather than the true God, and God raised up the Midianites to oppress them. For seven years, year after year, verse 4 says, they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey." Wave after wave of this oppression came, and, and eventually the people, verse 6 says, were brought low, and they cried out to the Lord. But rather than sending a deliverer immediately, as God had previously done, in this case, He sent them a prophet. Verse 7 says, the prophet says, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, it was I who brought you up from the land and brought you out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live.'" 
but you have not obeyed me. You see, God sent a prophet to remind them of all he had done for them and of their response, which was simply to reject and disobey him. Why this message? Well, it was a reminder that they did not deserve his help. He was magnifying the reality that they were undeserving of deliverance. He'd done so much for them, clearly demonstrating his power and greatness and love, and all they'd done in response was turn away from him. This was an undeserving people. That's our testimony as well. We deserve nothing but God's wrath, just like Israel did. And yet, in his grace for this undeserving people, God provided, as we again saw last week, an unexpected deliverer. Verse 12 says that the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, appeared while he was beating the grain in a wine press out of fear of, of the Midianites, and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Well, as we saw last week, this unexpected deliverer, Gideon, was really no better than the rest of the people. He himself was an undeserving idolater. We saw that his dad owned the, the altar to Baal, and we'll, we'll see later in chapter 8, he was a polygamist, and yet God came to him in his grace and said, I will use you. We also saw last week that he was humanly insignificant. His family was the least in Manasseh, he said, and I'm the youngest in my father's house. So there must have been something about Gideon, maybe some strength or character. No, neither. He was slow to trust the Lord. He questioned God. He made excuses about why he couldn't obey. He asked for sign after sign after sign. But God was patient and gracious towards him, reminding him it was about God not about him. God called him to remove the idolatry because while God is gracious, he in no way tolerates sin. And so in verse 27, Gideon obeyed, but he was afraid. He was timid and afraid, too afraid to do it during the day, so he did it at night. You know, this doubting, fearful, humanly insignificant idolater seems like just the perfect candidate, right? (laughs) Not from a human perspective, But from God's perspective, why? Why Gideon? Why would God choose such a man? Well, it's a a reminder that there are only weak and unworthy people. There is nobody better. God, God only can use those who are sinful and flawed because that's all of humanity. If God will use us in some way for the good of others and the glory of his name, it will be in spite of us, not because of us. And it's a reminder that it's only those who are most aware of their unworthiness who are most useful to God. You know, in some ways, Gideon was right about himself. He he was right to recognize he was a lousy man for the job. And God didn't want him to get puffed up in himself. He wanted to remind him of his power. He wanted Gideon to have confidence in him, which is why he said, the Lord is with you. And we were reminded that through using these people, God alone gets the glory. And so we left last week at the end of chapter 6 with God having raised up this unexpected deliverer. The Midianites and the Amalekites came in verse 33, and they assembled themselves against the people, and the Spirit of God came upon Gideon, and he gathered men from the, the neighboring tribes. For this undeserving people, God raised up an unexpected deliverer. And now in chapter 7 today, he gives him an unorthodox plan. Pick up the story in chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod, and the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley." That Jezreel Valley where they had camped is in the the heart of Israel. It's a massive valley, and there were two massive armies camped on either side. We see in verse 3 that there were 32,000 Israelites who had gathered with the call of Gideon. Chapter 8, verse 10 says there were 135,000 Midianites. You know, if you were one of those Israelite soldiers and you had some idea of how many of you there were and how many of them there were, you would have certainly thought, huh, the odds are, are slightly in their favor. God agrees that there's a problem with the odds. He says, Gideon, we've got a problem. There's too many people. Gideon's thinking, right, they've got over four times what 
what we have, or about four times what we have. In, in verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, no, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. Gideon's like, I, I don't think I heard you right. <laughs> you know, not, not too many Midianites. There, you know, God says that it's not that there's too many of them, it's there's too many with you for me to give them into your hands. God says, why? Why why are there too many with you, Gideon? The end of verse 2, for Israel would become boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. God says, if I deliver you with this size army, it will be far too easy for the Israelites to take the credit. The glory might fall on on the Israelite soldiers and army rather than on Israel's God. God says, there's too many for me to deliver the Midianites. So verse 3, he says, now therefore come and proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. Gather them all around, say, if you're scared, you can go home. 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. That 32,000-member army is now down to 10,000. I'm sure the, uh, the, that Gideon is thinking, you know, we'll definitely give you glory. 10,000 against 135. And, and verse 4, the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. And that, too easy for you to take the credit. And so he says, bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Therefore it shall be that he of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you, but every one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Because we're going we're gonna to thin the ranks a little bit more. And, and so Gideon brought the people down to the water, verse 5, and the Lord said to Gideon, you shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. There's been a lot of debate over exactly what this test was. Was it a test of alertness of the men? What was it even that they were, how were they drinking exactly? The point, I think, is largely this. We're going we're gonna to whittle it down to a lot less guys. And so, verse 6 says, the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hands. So let the other people go, each man to his home. God says, now we're talking. I like those odds, 300 versus 135,000. Imagine being Gideon. Imagine God having come to you and said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to use you. And and at the start of that, you know, it's like, ah, there's 32,000 people following me. Man, Lord, you are amazing to raise up this army. And now you're sitting there looking out at the Midianite camp, and you've got 300 men and you're thinking, who am I going to trust here? <laughs> this isn't in the military strategy books, but verse 8 says, the 300 men, they took the people's provisions and their trumpets into their hands, and Gideon sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tent, but retained the 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Gideon obeyed. He sent the others away. That's why Gideon is is marked for his faith. He trusted the Lord in this case. And and think about the faith of those other 300 men as they watch their their, uh, countrymen walk away and they see there's 300 of us left. You know, it's, it's significant to me that in the midst of this, God is making it very clear that this is his plan, not man's plan. This is based on God's wisdom, not man's. But he is patient and gracious to encourage Gideon along the way. And so verse 9 begins a little bit of a, of a parenthesis in the story as, as God encourages Gideon. And he says this to him. He says, that, the, that night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I've given it into your hands.'" 
But if you're afraid to go down, go with Pura, your servant, down to the camp, and you'll hear what they say, and afterwards your hands will be strengthened that you may go down against the camp. He said, Gideon, I want you to go down there. It's going to encourage your heart. It's going to strengthen you for what I've called you to do. You're going to hear something that's going to be good news for you. And if you're afraid, take your servant. And notice what Gideon did. He took his servant. (laughs) He was afraid. (laughs) This is the kind of guy God's using here, not this fearless leader. This is Gideon taking his servant. They go down, and it describes how they overhear one of the soldiers saying this, he says, behold, I had a dream in verse 13, a a loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian and it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his friend replied and said, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. God sent him down there to overhear this conversation about the dream that God had sent With the result, verse 15, that when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He said, God, you are going to do this. You are worthy. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. What a picture of God's continued patience and faithfulness. We saw that so clearly last week as God was just faithful to, to help Gideon see him more clearly so that he could trust him and obey. Again, that's what Gideon did. He, verse 16, divided the 300 men into three companies. He put trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them with torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I and all who are with me blow the trumpet, then you also blow the trumpets all around the camp and say, for the Lord and for Gideon. That's the plan, guys. 300 of us will divide into three groups. You got your trumpet, you got your torch covered with a pitcher, and when I start blowing the trumpet and all the guys with me, you start blowing the trumpets. You know, what's missing from this strategy? Well, all the soldiers they sent home, weapons. You know, you've just watched 22,000 guys leave who are afraid, another 9,700 because they drank wrong, and now you're one of 300 guys with trumpets and torches, and this is the plan. You know, God's wisdom often stands in stark contrast with man's wisdom, doesn't it? But Gideon and the men respond in faith and obedience. And how about us? When God's Word, when His wisdom to us doesn't line up with cultural wisdom. You know, I don't think God's going to call us to attack the nearby neighborhood with trumpets and torches. But he does call us to trust him and to obey him when his word makes about this much sense to the world around us. You know, we've been doing a a series this summer. Tom's been teaching us about trending versus truth and all the ways our world gets it wrong. Are we going to believe the wisdom of man, or are we going to stand for the wisdom of God? On issues like the definition of marriage and the permanence of marriage and marriage roles, on issues of sexual purity and modesty, on the responsibilities of parents and the blessing of children, on biblical financial stewardship, on how to respond to and treat our enemies or those who have wronged us, on living for Christ rather than self, on the appropriate view of and response to human authorities on responding to suffering with joy and with peace. On all of those things and more, God has a very different perspective than the world. Are you tempted to trust your own wisdom or the wisdom of the culture to talk back to God, or or do you trust Him and what He's revealed in His Word, responding in faith and obedience, even when you may not fully understand His wisdom or His plan? You ever think of us as a a church corporately? Will we remain committed to following God's plan for the church, God's plan to build His church in the world, even when it seems simplistic to many in our culture? You know, God's plan for building His church doesn't fit with what the world says you should do to build an organization. Using cutting-edge methods or marketing or attracting people through entertainment or through the personalities of, of leadership God has a different plan. 
a plan to build his church and make disciples of the nations by saving sinners through the simple power of the gospel message faithfully proclaimed, by equipping those saved sinners, the saints, through the ministry of God's word in the local church, saints using those gifts for the building up of the body and the proclamation of Christ to a watching world. God says, that's my plan. That's the mission. That's how it's I'm going to build my church. It's a plan that from the world's perspective looks a lot like battling 135,000 enemies with 300 guys with torches and trumpets. From a human perspective, it doesn't seem like it's going to work, but it's God's plan, and He will use it to accomplish His purposes, and He will do it in a way that He alone gets the glory. So Gideon and the men responded to God's unorthodox plan with faith and obedience, which results, fourthly, in an uncanny deliverance. Look at verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. And when the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hand for blowing, and they cried a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran, crying out as they fled. And when they blew 300 trumpets, the Lord set the sword of one against another, even throughout the whole army." Chapter 8, verse 10 says that 120,000 of them died, and the army fled. What did God do? As they acted in faith, blowing their trumpets and holding their torches, God routed the Midianite army. He confused them. They began fighting, thinking there were Israelites among them, but they were fighting each other, and 120,000 of them were killed. Gideon, as the army fled, summoned others' help in pursuing them. They captured and killed two of the Midianite leaders, likely two of their generals. God delivered them. He used 300 men, some trumpets and torches, to vanquish an army of 135,000. Truly, this was an uncanny deliverance. You know, what would you expect next in the account? God, having done this amazing thing, putting His power and grace on display. Look back at chapter 4, verse 23 of Judges. When God had delivered His people from Jabin, the king of Canaan, verse 23 says, God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the sons of Israel, and the hand of the sons of Israel pressed heavier and heavier upon Jabin the king until they had destroyed him. And verse five, or chapter 5, verse 1 says, Then Deborah and Barak the son of Abinoam sang on that day, saying that the leaders led in Israel that the people volunteered, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers, I to the Lord I will sing. I will praise to sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. And they go on through all of chapter 5, praising God for the work that He had done. What an appropriate response, right? The fact that there were leaders leading, that there were volunteers who were willing to to battle, praise the Lord. Well, sadly, we see in chapter 8 that this uncanny deliverance by the Lord is followed in this case by an unworthy response. You see, rather than worshiping Yahweh, their deliverer, there is a self-centeredness that permeates this chapter a zeal for personal agendas and exaltation overshadows the humble trust in the Lord that characterized chapter 7. Their response really only confirms how undeserving they were in the first place of God's grace and help. First, we see an unworthy response from the men of Ephraim. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. 
It says, then the men of Ephraim, one of the tribes who had not been summoned by Gideon, said to him, what is this thing you have done to us, not calling us when you went to fight against Midian? And they contended with him vigorously. Ephraim was one of the leading tribes in Israel at the time. Joshua had been from that tribe. And and when they hear of what had happened, is their response to say, wow, God is amazing. You, You didn't even need us. He's so powerful. No. They say, why didn't you let us help? We didn't get our share of the glory. Notice Gideon placates them with with some flattery and and diplomacy, verse 2. He says, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaming of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezar? He says, you know, I'm nothing compared to you. You guys are great. He just feeds their their self-centeredness. You see, the men of Ephraim did not respond to the uncanny deliverance of God with worship. They responded with a self-centered anger over not getting more of the glory and the spoils of war. We see an unworthy response also from the men of Succoth. Look at verse 4. It says, Then Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the Jordan and crossed over, weary yet pursuing. They were pursuing the, the kings of Midian who had fled. And, and he said to the men of Succoth, please give loaves of bread to the people who are following me, for they are weary, and I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. The leaders of Succoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hands, or the heads of, hands of them, that we should give bread to your army? See, Gideon and his men are pursuing them, They are weary from all that has gone on. They ask for some provisions from the men of Succoth, and their response is, no thanks. (laughs) Talk to us when you actually have them. (laughs) What's going on? Why are they hesitant to to assist them in this way? It seems that they they simply don't want to get entangled in the conflict if things don't go Gideon's way. (laughs) See, if Gideon ends up being defeated by the Midianite kings and word gets back that they had helped Gideon, who's now in the the crosshairs of the Midianites? It's them. So they say, we don't want to put ourselves in, in harm's way. You see, they didn't respond to the uncanny deliverance of God with worship and trust. They responded instead with a focus on self preservation. Next, we see an unworthy response from from Gideon. When the men of Succoth spurned his request for help, what did Gideon do? Did he respond with the same grace and patience that God had shown him, carefully leading him and and faithfully dealing with him in a patient way? No, not exactly. Look at verse 7. Gideon said, all right, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hands, then I will thrash your bodies with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. He says, I'm going to go get those kings, and when, I, when I've got them, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to deal with you. Gideon was not happy, and he goes on, verses 10 to 12, to capture the Midianite kings. He exacts revenge on the men of Succoth in verses 13 to 17, and then he kills the Midianite kings in in verses 18 to 20, and and we learn that he was particularly motivated to do that out of seeking vengeance for his brothers who had likely been involved in an earlier skirmish with the Midianites and, and had been killed. You see, Gideon's focus shifted from obeying the Lord and and trusting the Lord to deliver the people to avenging wrongs that others had done to him, and including the death of his brothers. It's become a personal vendetta for him. It's become all about him. You know, it's so easy to, to take the spotlight off of God and His grace and to shine it back on ourselves, to lose sight of living for Him and trusting Him and, and to live for us. Gideon's defeat of the Midianites, his execution of their kings, leads to another unworthy response, this one from the men of Israel. Look at verse 22. It says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's son, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. Midian. 
You know, it's easy to take the spotlight off God and shine it on ourselves. It's also easy to take the spotlight off God and His grace and shine that on others, to take God's glory and give it elsewhere. Think of the contrast between chapter 5 and, and chapter 8 that we saw. Chapter 5, we, we bless you, O God, for the leaders. Chapter 8, Gideon, you've delivered us. Be our king. They think it's all about Gideon when really it's all about God. Now, this doesn't mean we shouldn't appropriately honor or express gratitude for others. If you go back and read that hymn of praise in, in, uh, in chapter 5, it acknowledges that leaders and, and volunteers had served. It names names of those who are to be honored, but it does so with an attitude of blessing the Lord, of thanking God for those people, of, of praising God by recognizing those that in His grace He had raised up Again, not because of them. We must be careful not to rob God of the glory due Him as the men of Israel do here. Notice Gideon's response, verse 23, he said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Gideon at least gets it theologically correct. He says, no, I will not rule as king. We already have a king, and that king is Yahweh the Lord. But Gideon, while he says, I'm not going to be king, he, he sort of says, but I am okay if you want to treat me like one. <laughs> Verse 24 says this, yet Gideon said to them, I would request of you, well, now that you mention it, that each of you give me an earring from his spoil, for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites, and they said, we'll surely give them. So they spread out a garment, and every one of them threw an earring there from his spoil. And the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple rows, which were the kings of Midian, and besides the neck bands that were on their camels' necks. He, he says, you know, if you want to give me a, a lot of riches and and spoils of war, I'd be happy to take those off your hands. And he made them, verse 27, into an ephod and placed it in his city, Ophrah, and the, all of Israel played the harlot with it there so that it became a snare to Gideon and his household. Gideon said, I won't be king, but you can kind of treat me that way. I, I want to be exalted in the eyes of the people. I want the wealth of this world. One commentator put this season of his life this way. He said, the final chapter of Gideon's life appears to have a distinct anticlimax to the heroic actions of the earlier section. And the man who had given such a magnificent lead to his fellows now sets a deplorable example of self-indulgence in which he, his family, and the whole nation were involved. Perhaps it is easier to honor God in some courageous action in the limelight of a time of national emergency than it is to honor Him consistently in the ordinary, everyday life, which requires a different kind of courage. That, that was Gideon as he lived out the latter years of his life. Verse 28 summarizes what had taken place as is typical at the end of these cycles. And it says, So Midian was subdued before the sons of Israel, and they did not lift up their heads anymore. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Gideon went back and lived in his hometown with his wives and his many children. And verse 33 says, Then it came about as soon as Gideon was dead, that the sons of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bareth their God. Thus the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. What a sad picture of the end of this account, isn't it? They once again spurned God's grace and rejected them. They saw the amazing works of God, but they did not dwell on those things. They focused on self instead of on Him. But God's not done with them. He will continue to be faithful and gracious in spite of them. We'll actually see more of that 
perspective in the psalm that we studied together tonight, Psalm 78. God continued to be faithful. You know, I hope this morning that we will each be amazed at God's amazing grace, demonstrated in the deliverance through Gideon, but that we will respond in a worthy manner with worship, not as Gideon and the Israelites did with a focus on self. But there's a a greater parallel we need to recognize this morning. The judges, including Gideon, were a taste of a greater deliverer and a greater deliverance yet to come, that of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You know, the reality is we are an undeserving people. We don't stand in judgment of Israel. We don't read this account and be like, how could they? We see ourselves reflected in it, in them. As Isaiah 53 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. While we may not set up idol altars in our front yard, our our hearts are so prone to worship that which is not God. Ourselves, other things, we are an undeserving people, but God provided Christ who was an unexpected deliverer. You know, we read in, in Isaiah 53 earlier that there was nothing about Christ that, that people would be drawn to Him. You know, He came as the Messiah, and His people said, you're not what we wanted. You're not what we expected. Even John the Baptist asked Him at one point, are you the expected one, or should we look for someone else? Jesus was not the Messiah the people thought would come, but He was the Deliverer, the Messiah that God sent in His wisdom. And the gospel is an unorthodox plan. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. We looked at a, a portion of this text together last week. 1 Corinthians 1 reminds us that God uses the weak of the world, and it, it reminds us that God's plan for salvation is folly to the world. The gospel is an unorthodox plan. The cross is foolishness. Verse 18 of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians says, for the word of the cross is what? It is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. Verse 21 says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who would believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block and a Gentile's foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The word of the cross, the gospel is foolishness to the world, but it is the power of God unto salvation, which is an uncanny deliverance. Sinful people declared right with a holy God. The unrighteous declared righteous, God's enemies having become His children. And so my question to each of us is, will we have an unworthy response? Will we hear of what God has done and will we say, yeah, no big deal, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my life how I want to live my life? Or will we respond in, in humility, in repentance, in faith, and in awe and wonder at what God has done? Will we worship Christ not just in, in song together, but in our lives and living for Him? Or will we lose that focus and, and just be consumed with our own personal agenda and glory? Do you view God's grace as a a license to sin, or are you motivated to obey Him out of gratitude? Do you boast in the Lord and in the cross? God is an amazingly gracious God. To us, an undeserving people, He gave an unexpected deliverer, using an unorthodox plan to provide an uncanny deliverance. May we respond in a worthy manner, giving all the glory to Him. You know, this morning, it's our joy to remember this reality of God's grace toward us through the work of Christ in the particular manner that He commanded us, that He prescribed for us to do that through the celebration of the Lord's table. If you're a follower in Christ, 
You should have picked up uh, one of the little cups on your way in that has the elements. We'll take those together in a few minutes. But this memorial prescribed by Christ Himself is for all of those who are truly in Christ who have recognized their need of Him, recognized that what we deserve is only God's wrath, and who are trusting solely in the Redeemer that He provided, those who've humbly cried out to the Lord in repentance and faith, and now who are striving to live in obedience to Him, not perfectly, but not holding on to sin, longing to be like Jesus and having confessed our sin to Him as 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 says, a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and, and drink of the cup. Let's take just a, a moment to confess our sins to the Lord, to consider our own heart before Him in Christ. <laughs> 